Hi, this is uh, Dave Babson. I'm a program director at RPE. Hi, I'm Scott Litzman. I'm a program director at RPE. Hey, everyone. I'm Zara LaRue. I am a fellow at RPE. And I'm Greg Thiel, and I'm also a fellow at RPE. And this is a webinar we're hosting on engineered negative emission technologies. Now, before we get started, we just have a few caveats about the webinar. First, this is not a funding opportunity announcement. At the time we're recording this, which is late October 2020, there is no funding opportunity announcement at this time. However, RPE is continually posting new funding opportunity announcements, and we encourage you to go to our funding exchange website, which is arpa-e-foa.energy.gov, and keep an eye open for any new FOAs as they come out. And we also encourage you to sign up for our mailing list so that you know when FOAs come out. So now that I've said what this, this webinar is not, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dave, to describe what we are gonna talk about today. Thanks, Scott. We're gonna be talking about engineered negative emissions technologies. The scope that we're interested in, despite the fact that negative emissions technologies cover a wide range of concepts, including accelerated CO2 mineralization, afforestation, biomass with carbon capture and storage, or soil sequestration strategies. This webinar is going to focus on two negative emission technologies, engineered approaches that can be scaled and that we are interested in, in uh, pursuing, including the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, known as direct air capture, and the removal of dissolved CO2 from seawater, uh, known as direct ocean capture. Negative emissions technologies are important to RPE. This plot here shows the trajectory that we need to follow in terms of global net emissions to keep global temperatures below two degrees of rise. The red line in the center uh, tracks that, that path. And as you can see, it actually passes through zero. We actually need to uh, achieve a net negative emissions economy somewhat after 2050. The, uh, x-axis here is time and the y-axis are the the net emissions in uh, gigatons per year below the zero line in blue you can see the amount of negative emissions that are necessary and are contributing to this red line and the contribution of negative emissions to the total net emissions are quite significant even well before the crossover point this is to say that we need to think about building and growing a negative emissions industry immediately um, to achieve gigaton scales of carbon removal by about uh, 2035, about 10 gigatons of carbon removal by 2060, and 20 gigatons of carbon removal by 2020. This is to say that one of the largest industries on the face of the earth needs to be created and our interests are in ensuring that we can service this very large industry with technologies that are going to be low cost and energy efficient. The objectives of this webinar are to uh, give some sort of an introduction on DAC and DOC for those who aren't familiar with it, present viewpoints on this space from current program directors and fellows, describe areas of interest for potential future programs, and solicit your feedback on what we should be focusing on in this space. Thanks, Dave. So just to talk a little bit more about uh, the role we see and why we're so interested in negative emission technologies, this is a report from Goldman Sachs called Carbonomics in December 2019, where they looked at the carbon abatement costs for different industries. So this is the red line here. So this is the cost for a certain industry to, to abate CO2 and the blue line is sort of a CCS, like either point source or negative emissions technologies associated with that. And what you can see is that some technologies, the cost to decarbonize is relatively small, but as you get to these harder to de decarbonize sectors, the cost increases very much, and there are other um, emissions for which there is no technology to decarbonize. So what they concluded is that for these very costly or ones where there's no technology, instead of directly decarbonizing, what might happen in the future is something like this is direct air capture, which is the most expensive negative emission, but also probably the most scalable, using that as an offset rather than paying $600 or $1,000 per ton to directly abate some of these. And so um, 
we see the potential, like, and, and Dave mentioned, using this for offsets for some of these hard to decarbonize sectors. And this is an idea consistent with a recent report from Columbia University on the levelized cost of carbon abatement, where they looked at one scenario that was sustainable um, aviation biofuels compared to direct air capture. And the conclusion was that direct air capture might be a cheaper form of decarbonization. So what this means is that we're gonna need a lot of capacity. So we estimate that the United States will need gigatons of direct air capture and direct ocean capture just to get to net zero. That's consistent with what David showed you, uh, the blue section of that cur cur curve we just showed you, that gigatons just for net zero. That means if we look at the energy input for today's technologies, that would be tens of exajoules, which is similar to a quadrillion BTU or quad of heat, and several exajoules of electricity, and that's delivered, that's not primary energy. So just an, a massive amount of energy required. If those exajoules of electricity were renewables, and we assume a 35% capacity factor, we would need over 200 gigawatts of dedicated renewable capacity, which is more than the entire US capacity today, in order to power uh, that direct air capture, direct ocean capture. And so what this means is this will become a segment of the economy. Carbon management, carbon removal, um, we will need so much capacity and so energy intensive that it just becomes its own segment. And this is something we want to emphasize and, and discuss. So RPE has funded several projects to date. Starting in open 2018, Arizona State is developing a hollow fiber membrane as part of a moisture swing process. In seed, um, a company called Verdox is an electrochemical approach. They're using electroswing to capture and release CO2 based on redox reactions. In the FLEX program, we have three projects that are looking at the integration between natural gas combined cycle and direct air capture systems in how a point source CCS and a DAC system could operate synergistically. And our most recent foe is for DAC and DOC. We funded six teams that are looking at electrochemical approaches, hydrolytic softening, and optimizing air contactors. Great, so now that we've set the stage, um, both in terms of you know, the big picture, net pic big picture NEP, as well as DAC and DOC specifically, um, we now wanna dive a little bit deeper and talk about both the strengths and the challenges of these two technologies. Um, so as you can see on this slide, this is kind of high level, um, just a few of the strengths that, that are important to us um, at RPE when we think about these technologies. So for direct air capture, um, one really positive about this technology is its location independence. Um, and what that means is that it can be deployed strategically and in locations where um, it's not competing um, with, with land use that might be used for agricultural or other uses. Um, and along those lines, you can think about actually integrating direct air capture with the end users, whether that's um, a, an entity that, that is utilizing the CO2 or an entity that is storing the CO2. And so you can think about eliminating or greatly reducing the need to transport the CO2 because you can be strategic about where you place a DAC unit. On the ocean side, as you can see here, um, the source that you know, you're pulling the CO2 from has a very high volumetric concentration of carbon. And so you can think about that as an advantage um, for dock systems. Additionally, um, dock essentially directly reverses the CO2-induced ocean acidification. So from an environmental and a sustainability perspective, that's, um, that's really important. And then similarly to DAC, DAC can also, um, you can think about placing these systems where they can be integrated to both um, offshore users of CO2 and or offshore storage sites. And so you can, again, kind of think about reducing that need to transport CO2 um, and be strategic about where you place these systems. So there are also a number of challenges associated with these systems there. It's, you know, these systems are still early stage and there's not very many examples yet in the field. And um, a big challenge is, is cost and specifically capital costs. So in our survey of, of open literature, we've seen, you know, benchmark values for, for capital cost exceeding uh, RPE's targets for the total levelized cost of carbon capture around $100 a ton. And so we think that there are a, a lot of avenues to um, research in order to reduce that capital cost, including um, materials uh, contactors, air or water contactors, and increasing system lifetimes. Um, we also think efficiency is a challenge, and, um, and it's an important one to attack um, because higher efficiency 
um, means lower operational emissions potentially. And um, so if you have a system that uh, is more efficient, it uses less energy, that means you have to build out um, less energy generating capacity. And, and uh, depending on the type of that energy generating capacity, um, you may emit uh, less uh, uh, operational emissions as well. Um, we also think that good designs um, should avoid needing sort of new industries to produce chemicals or, or water or chemical inputs to the system um, and or deal with um, chemical or water outputs from that system as, as well. So we think that water and chemical consumption is, is an important challenge uh, to be overcome. And finally, of course, as, as Scott and, and, and David mentioned at the beginning, scalability is, is really critical um, um, for these technologies because um, there is predicted to be such a large uh, need for negative emissions technologies um, in the second half of this century. In terms of DOC specifically, uh, we wanted to highlight a few sort of technoeconomic benchmarks and challenges. Um, as I mentioned just a second ago, cost is really critical. So um, again, these are early stage technologies, but, but estimates in open literature place sort of the cost of, of DOC systems between $400 roughly and, and $2,400 per metric ton of CO2. So um, there's a, a big need to reduce that cost. Um, and we, we think that system designs, component designs, and siting strategies can all be, can all be a part of, of, of achieving much, much lower costs. And we also know that operating in an oceanic environment is, is, is challenging. So um, seawater often needs a lot of pretreatment before it can be uh, flowed through an engineered system to avoid things like fouling and scaling. Um, Ocean-based systems, of course, have contact with marine life. So um, there, there's a challenge there to, to design a system that can sort of reduce uh, and minimize um, adverse impacts on marine life. And finally, of course, seawater can be uh, corrosive to common materials of construction, and so that can contribute to cost increases um, and operational challenges as well. And to mirror that previous slide, we now have kind of the analogous challenges and techno-economic benchmarks for direct air capture systems. Um, so, so first and foremost, you know, similar to the points that Greg has already made, we need to drive down the cost of these systems. We have various um, estimates from, from literature and from pilot systems that range from just under $100 per ton of CO2 to hundreds of dollars per ton of CO2. And regardless of exactly where the number falls today, we know that it needs to be, it needs to come down. It needs to become cheaper. And so at RPE, we're thinking about systems that can focus on modularity and take advantage of mass manufacturing, which can further help drive down the cost um, and, and push this technology down the learning curve. Um, and those are, you know, some of the things that we're really interested in. Um, but first and foremost, we need, we need to develop more of these systems. We need to get more of them in the field operating so that we can learn from them. Similarly, um, we need to drive down the energy requirements. Current estimates are, are much higher than the thermodynamic minimum, which again is, is around 20 kilojoules per mole of CO2. And so we want to see system designs that are attacking this challenge and thinking about um, how to reduce both the electrical and the thermal requirements. One way that, that we can think of um, and that, you know, researchers have been looking at in the field is um, passive system designs. And this is a means to, to reduce some of that operational cost. Passive system designs um, reduce the need to pay to move the air um, through your system. Um, and so you don't need to scale cost with throughput anymore. And so this is a means to, um, to kind of defy the relationship that Sherwood's rule would suggest that um, cost increases as concentration decreases. And so by removing the need to, um, to pay uh, proportionally to every air molecule that, that, um, that moves through your system, we're looking at and interested in systems that are, that are passive um, and that can reduce that need. And so in short, essentially, you know, it boils down to thinking about both CapEx and OpEx and the trade-offs between the two and thinking about um, smart designs that, that take advantage of ambient conditions um, that can help drive down the cost. 
And to continue thinking about how we're looking at DAX solutions, you know, they're top down and bottom up ways to look at technology challenges. I think in DAC, a lot of people have been looking at it from a bottom up approach. So they'll start with the capture material. They'll say, here's a capture material that has high working capacity for CO2, high selectivity, it's stable and it's cheap. What can I do with this material? They start thinking about air contactor. Okay, how do I get this material in contact with as much CO2 as possible? And then there's a separation cycle. Is this very high temperature heat that's required? Is it low temperature heat? Is it some other form of like electricity as an input? Um, you know, the absorption is one thing, but how are you desorbing CO2 and how are you desorbing ideally at a high purity um, and maybe in high pressure? And then the U.S. energy system, which I think most U.S. most researchers are not focusing on, but here at RB, this is something that we are very much focusing on and consistent with some of the earlier slides that we showed today. So we're thinking about it more from a top-down approach. And when you think about it that way, you really start with that energy input. You know, is that heat and or electricity? And that there could be different approaches. So someone might have a, an approach that relies on low carbon heat. Let's just say, for example, geothermal. So I'm an integrate director capture with geothermal. Well, what does that look like? And what are the technology specifics? In that case, for example, they might say, well, how can I minimize the electricity requirements since it's really a heat driven approach? Or conversely, someone might say, I have an approach that's only based on electricity. If you look at some of those project examples I showed earlier from our prior FOAs, several of them are looking at electricity only inputs that it would just be say, integrated renewables or some other form of low carbon electricity and not having a heat input. And there could even be other types of energy inputs like photosensitive processes. So we're really starting from there because of the scaling issue that we've been talking about. From that, you can start saying, okay, now let's think about the separation cycle. Zara just mentioned this earlier. You know, what are the CapEx and OpEx trade-offs? Is it worth paying additional CapEx in order to drive to higher efficiency? That's something that really needs to be thought about at the system level. The desorption is, is a critical part of that. How is that done? What is the purity of that? How much water is required from a sustainability point of view? These are all things that, that we're thinking through very carefully. The air contactor is very important. How do you co-optimize high heat and mass transfer while maintaining low pressure drop, ideally as part of a passive system? And the capture material is very important. So for techno-economic analyses, probably the single biggest cost driver for a DAC process is the, cap the capital cost for the capture medium itself. So it needs to be very low cost. It has to have long lifetime, and it has to have high performance, like high working capacity for CO2, high selectivity, and other parameters as well. So this is just a way of, of showing different ways of thinking about this. And you can see that we've been thinking about more from a top down and we encourage researchers to think that way to see how their processes fit in the broader scheme of things. To summarize, negative emissions technologies are essential for servicing a future negative emissions industry that will help us achieve ambitious climate targets. We know that Engineered negative emissions technologies like DAC and DOC are crucial and are important to RPE's mission of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We have funded projects in DAC and DOC, but more work must be done. Researchers are encouraged to engage with us, to give us more information about what we should be focusing on and to help uh, promote our efforts in this space. Thanks for watching. We hope that you'll consider some uh, proposals for future funding opportunities. Please look at our exchange site uh, as that's where we post these opportunities when they become available and feel free to reach out to us to discuss any ideas that you might have in this space. Okay. Thank you very much everyone.